Temla, from CNRS, Alexander Karpov, from uh, uh, GINR Dubna, Yuri uh, Engelbrecht, from the uh, Estonian Academy of Sciences, and Maurizio Bona, uh, former senior staff member from CERN. Uh, for Karin, uh, who is online already, Karin uh, Shemla, uh, I want to, I hope she can uh, hear me. Uh, we will start not by Karin, with Karin, but with Maurizio Bona, because he has to leave at 10 to uh, 1. And since we are a bit late, uh, somewhat late, uh, I would not like uh, that uh, we are in a hurry. So we will start with Maurizio Bona. Uh, I will allow for one or two questions at the end of his talk, uh, so that then he can be relaxed. Uh, maybe uh, other questions can, can come at, at the end of the, of the panel. And then we will go through the uh, order which is on the program, Karin Chemla, Alexander Karpov, and Yuri uh, Engelbrecht. So uh, Maurizio Bona, uh, as I said, a former senior staff member of the uh, European Organization for Nuclear Research CERN at Geneva. You will talk about uh, CERN, CESAME, and CEIST, scientific research as promoter of intercultural dialogue and peace. You have 20 minutes. Can I start already now? Yes. Okay. Good morning, and uh, thank you to the organizers for having invited me. As uh, Michel said, I was a CERN staff member for almost 40 years. So now I'm a retired person and hence I will speak on my behalf and not on behalf of the organization. The second... Uh, okay. So the second uh, announcement I wanted to to give you is that I will not talk about uh, sport or music as I would uh, perhaps like, but I put this picture uh, to start my presentation just to put together three uh, people who represent uh, three uh, domains to which uh, usually it is recognized a sort of neutrality and universality. So music with uh, Daniel Barenboim, physics or science with uh, Albert Einstein and the greatest Pelé for sport. But today I will mainly concentrate on uh, the uh, role of uh, uh, science uh, as a, an enabler of uh, dialogue and uh, intercultural dialogue and uh, peace, which is a topic that today is particularly important due to the uh, tensions that we all know about that uh, pervade our world. And I will start with uh, something about uh, CERN and the uh, origins of CERN that maybe some of you have already heard many times by reminding that CERN has a double dimension. Uh, in addition to the CERN that uh, many people know as a center for international cooperation on particle physics, there is also another dimension of CERN, which is uh, uh, the dimension of uh, an intergovernmental organization this is the picture I took uh, uh, in, the, in the General Assembly Hall at the United Nations when the organization was granted the status of, uh, of observer. And I would like to go back to the time when uh, CERN was uh, funded. It was uh, just after the Second World War. And uh, I would like to stress in particular that it was not funded just on the uh, on the action of uh, scientists who were, of course, interested in uh, resuming contacts uh, after the stop due to the uh, Second World War. But it was something that uh, CERN was something that was uh, possible thanks to the, uh, the vision and the interest of, of a group of uh, scientists, politicians, diplomats and intellectuals who found it uh, absolutely necessary to resume the research on particle physics, but also to use this new institution to be created as an element to foster the intercultural dialogue and to put together again countries that were fighting until a few years uh, before. And uh, <clears throat> the first idea uh, of uh, the creation of CERN did not uh, come out uh, in a 
scientific meeting like the one we are having in this week uh, here, but it was presented at uh, the European Cultural Conference in Lausanne in uh, 1949. So it was a conference on culture and CERN or this institution to be created was thought to be not only a center to, uh, to carry out the research, but also a center for culture. And this is an important point. And the important point is also to stress uh, the role that uh, had people who were uh, not scientists, people like uh, diplomats, uh, intellectuals, and, uh, and, uh, and politicians. And uh, these people were very, very clear in uh, selecting the main objectives of the new organization to come, which were science, because it was important to do science at the, possibly at the highest level, but also the, uh, this uh, function of uh, fostering the intercultural dialogue after the war. And uh, I put on this slide uh, the, uh, one of the main sentences which is contained in the, in the, in the uh, convention of CERN, which was uh, signed uh, in 1953, which says very clearly that uh, the organization had uh, nothing to do with any military application and also that everything that was uh, developed by CERN had to be publicly dis uh, displaced and uh, uh, the, um, uh, made available publicly. And these are two very important points because since uh, the beginning, thanks to this engagement of the organization, CERN was a place where it was uh, obvious that uh, science could uh, perform its uh, duties, but uh, also people could meet uh, in the most uh, free possible way. And I would like to uh, come back again on the role of non-scientists in this, because uh, if uh, the first idea was presented at a conference on uh, culture in Lausanne, it was then elaborated in an institution created in Geneva by uh, a writer, a philosopher, and uh, uh, intellectual, who uh, created in Geneva, the name is Denis de Rougemont, created in Geneva the European Cultural Center. And it was there that the idea was elaborate, elaborated further. And it was uh, there that uh, the idea of creating an institution based on the status of an intergovernmental organization started. And finally, a few years later, in 1953, the convention was signed. So please keep in mind 1949 and 1953. In four years, they were able to come to the signing of the convention of CERN. And I put there a sentence that was, uh, um, uh, let's say, one of the main, um, uh, let's say, ideas of, uh, of Denis de Rougemont, which is really something that to, to me is very important because it uh, attributes to this organization also uh, the role of a cultural institution and an institution that goes beyond pure scientific research. So you can, you can read it. And uh, the uh, other person I would like to mention here is uh, François de Rose. François de Rose was a, a diplomat, a French diplomat. He was ambassador for his country for many years. And he was a great friend of CERN. I had uh, the, the chance to, to see him uh, when he was very, very old, uh, coming to CERN uh, from time to time. And uh, the action of uh, the diplomats was really very important because they were really the link people between scientists and politicians who had to take finally the decision. And what is uh, interesting is also that uh, CERN recognized this uh, uh, situation, this, uh, um, let's say, action of uh, non-scientists by inviting them also the first meetings of the CERN Council that took place in 1954. So what I wanted to stress is that uh, the organization was not just the creation of scientists, but it was uh, the creation of this group of people which uh, had clearly in mind also the dimension of uh, an institution for the intercultural dialogue and peace. And uh, another sentence that I, I wanted to, 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 to show you is a sentence that it's, uh, I, I, I took from, uh, from the web. It's on the web pages of, uh, of CERN. 
uh, which uh, goes back to uh, 1960, when the first group of uh, uh, scientists from uh, uh, the Soviet Union was invited to come to CERN for a long-term stay. Others have been uh, present before, but uh, it was in July 1960 that uh, these uh, three uh, people on the right were welcomed at CERN based on a decision of the organization to invite people from the Soviet Union. So it was a clear, uh, let's say, statement of the organization that wanted to have also people from the Soviet Union. And this is important for something that I will say at the end of my, of my talk. So during the years, thanks to this uh, 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 idea that uh, CERN could be a place not only to do science, but also to, to meet with people, it was possible to, to, to do at CERN something that, uh, uh, let's say, some people call, uh, let's say, hidden diplomacy or soft diplomacy. So without having any uh, mandate for that, uh, the organization could be the place where people from different countries could meet for the first time for instance, people from Israel and people from Germany. And later, people from uh, the two Germanys uh, could, uh, could meet uh, in, in an informal way. And this helped, in some cases, to uh, keep alive the dialogue during the, 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 the Iron Curtain period between two blocs that uh, had the difficulties to talk uh, to, uh, to each other. Uh, there are many anecdotes. Uh, my director general, when I was hired at CERN at the beginning of the 80s, uh, uh, is still involved in this. His name is uh, Herwig Schopper, and he wrote several articles. So you can find a lot of uh, uh, anecdotes on uh, situations that uh, uh, were, to some extent, helped by this neutrality of the organization. I decided to, to take one of these uh, of these uh, um, situations, which was uh, the first meeting between uh, uh, Mr. Reagan and Mr. Gorbachev, the heads of uh, US and, uh, and the Soviet Union at that time, that took place in Geneva at the end of, uh, of uh, 1985, in October, uh, and in which CERN, in a very informal way, uh, played a role, uh, in the sense that uh, it played a role because uh, the two teams of Sherpas that were sent to prepare the meeting between the two big bosses was at uh, a sort of deadlock. They did not trust with e each other. And finally, one of the members of the delegation uh, asked the uh, director general at that time, Herwig Schopper, to offer CERN as a place where they could meet and discuss without, uh, without uh, the risk of having microphones or other things that uh, could, uh, could perturb the meeting. So this happened, and uh, this happened in a way that uh, finally these people recognized that the neutral platform offered by the organization was uh, much better than the uh, previous uh, chosen uh, platforms that uh, didn't work. This does not mean at all that the meeting would have not taken place, but maybe it could have taken place a bit, a bit later. And uh, I forgot to mention another example of uh, this, uh, let's say, possibility for the, uh, an organization like CERN to, to be uh, considered neutral and uh, to promote initiatives that in other cases would have been more difficult by mentioning something that uh, for us was quite uh, uh, natural, quite obvious. For instance, the fact that uh, certain students from Palestine could come to CERN with the grants paid for by Israeli government. So this is something that in, in our world, in the world of science, in your world is absolutely normal. Please believe me, this is not normal in other words like the political one. So CERN uh, was, uh, thanks to his, uh, its convention and its governance system and the fact that it's an intergovernmental organization, uh, an example that uh, some people considered as uh, a good one, a good one which could be exported uh, in other places. And again, uh, there was the attempt to export these to another critical uh, area, which is the Middle East. Everything started um, around the mid of uh, the 90s uh, with some idea ca uh, came, uh, that came out from 
a committee that was in place uh, between CERN and CERN scientists and some Middle East uh, corresponding scientists to uh, promote the creation of an organization similar to CERN based on the same kind of convention as CERN, so an intergovernmental organization that could put together countries of, uh, um, of the region, countries that have difficulties in talking uh, to each other. And this uh, uh, was uh, then uh, facilitated by the fact that uh, Germany was going to dismiss uh, an installation, a BESI in DAISY, and uh, uh, the promoters of this idea, among which uh, Fubini, Rabinovici, and, uh, and uh, again uh, Schopper, uh, were able to convince the German government to offer the old installation, old for Germany, to this new uh, initiative. And uh, this uh, enormously helped uh, setting, out, uh, setting up uh, the organization, thanks also to the role, important role, that was played, like in the creation of CERN, by UNESCO, and in particular by Ferdinando Mayor, who was the director at that time of UNESCO. So, that group of people, again, politicians, scientists, and uh, diplomats, understood the importance to try, at least, to export the format and the, uh, and the idea of CERN in Middle East. So this, with some difficulties, of course, uh, was uh, uh, finally developed. And uh, um, finally, a few years later, 10 years later, around 2004, there was the formal constitution of uh, SESAME based on uh, the model and on the convention of, uh, of CERN. And CERN again played a role because the, um, the old director general, Harry Schopper, who I already mentioned, was appointed uh, the president of the Council of SESAME for the, uh, let's say, preliminary council. But then when he stepped down, Another director general of CERN, uh, Chris Llewellyn Smith, uh, took over as president. Later, the present president is uh, that person. Another director general, former director general of CERN, Rolf Hoyer, became the president of the council. So there is a link between the mother organization, CERN, and the daughter organization, uh, SESAME, which is very important. And I cannot, uh, of course, go into details now, but. Uh, it was not easy to find, uh, uh, let's say, the place where the installa installation should be put and also to uh, convince, uh, to uh, grant freedom of movement to all participants. But that was possible and this is a good thing. Now, very briefly, I would like to say that uh, after Sesame, there was also the idea to, uh, to do something for the Southern East uh, Europe or West Balkan area, as people say. So this is the sized project, which you heard already uh, yesterday from uh, from uh, from um, um, Neboja, uh, which uh, could have been something based on on the Tesla project. But uh, and I was present at the at the discussions at CERN. It, it was not. So this was an idea that was presented a few years ago to extend also to this area the, uh, the idea of creating an institution that uh, could be a science place but also a dialogue uh, place. So this institution now is evolving, at least in the discussions, towards a facility for tumor therapy. I don't have the time to discuss this in detail. But uh, since uh, the beginning, I mean it was in 2016, until now, the situation has been strongly, let's say, uh, affected by political discussions. At a certain point it, in 2018, I proposed the uh, promoters to involve also Switzerland, and uh, Switzerland was involved as uh, an attempt to have a neutral country to, to help, uh, let's say, going ahead. For the moment, the situation is that uh, there, is, uh, there, is, uh, uh, there are two groups. One is the group uh, for the site selection, and the other group is the one for the institutional uh, structure. Unfortunately, as far as I understood, because I didn't follow this in the last uh, period, it seems that uh, there is a certain reluctance to grant the status of intergovernmental organization. It would be rather an ERIC-style uh, uh, model. 
And this is the program, very optimistic one that uh, the Swiss uh, people uh, told me recently. I come now to the, uh, to the last uh, few uh, sentences, a few slides, a couple of slides, on, uh, let's say, the role that science can really play in the intercultural dialogue and peace. And I would like to go back to one of the uh, people I um, showed in the, at the beginning, uh, Daniel Barenboim, who, as probably some of you know, has uh, set up a sort of sesame for music with an orchestra, the West, West Eastern Divan Orchestra, uh, whose musicians are mainly from Palestine, Israel, from that area, plus some others from other countries. And uh, this is an orchestra that uh, sometimes is, uh, uh, let's say, depicted by people as an orchestra for peace. And I like to, uh, to, to show you a sentence, you can find the, 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 the video on YouTube, that was uh, said by, by uh, Baren Boim during a concert in Ramallah in 2005 when he was asked to explain this uh, uh, function of uh, uh, music for peace and orchestra for peace. Because one could say, you simply have to do more music and you will get peace, or you more science and you will get peace. And Baren Boim said uh, something that I fully subscribe for music, that orchestra is not going to bring peace itself. What it's going to bring is understanding, the passions, the courage, and the curiosity to listen to the narrative of the other. If you replace music with science, I think this uh, sentence fully, uh, fully represents also what science can do. And uh, considering that 65 years ago, countries, the political power, were capable to accept in a short period of time to set up an intergovernmental organization and to grant total freedom of circulation of idea and uh, relations to that organization. And the difficulties that we have today, where, an, uh, let's say, an, an idea like SAIST, which is uh, the granddaughter of that organization, receives certain obstacles and uh, the idea of an intergovernmental organization is no longer possible and even more when and this is the recent uh, uh, actuality uh, countries try to uh, let's say master a little bit or to include also in the political sphere the action of uh, an intergovernmental organization for science i wonder whether there is something that has changed. Something has changed, and to me, the main thing, and this is my last, uh, uh, my last statement, is that probably countries have lost a part of their understanding on the importance of uh, having passions, courage, and curiosity to listen to the narrative of the others. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Mauricio, for telling us about uh, this uh, science adventure, which was with CERN, uh, Sesame, and maybe uh, SAIST. Uh, so uh, you, you, you were in time. We have time for one or two questions before we move to the next ones. Uh, then uh, Mauricio will be free. Are there questions to Mauricio on the Science for Peace presentation? Uh, Amal Kasri. Can you give the, the micro? The mic? Okay. Uh, thanks, Maurice, Maurice, for this very interesting uh, information. I, I just actually a question. Thank you for posting this famous photo between Reagan and Gorbachev. But uh, I was very young, but I still remember very much this uh, event. Uh, but I think they met actually in Finland, not in not in Geneva, right? No, in Finland it was the second meeting. In uh, second meeting was in Reykjavik, I think, in January uh, 1986. The first meeting, uh, I know because uh, uh, in those days in Geneva it was impossible to circulate <laughs> almost. It was in October uh, 1985. So I okay, thank, thank you for correcting my information. The other question regarding the SEEIST as this ambitious uh, plan that you showed. Uh, so do you, is there uh, already an uh, idea about uh, the type of research that could be done? Uh, is there going to be a focus on certain area of research or is it going to be something like Sesame, for example, more... Uh, uh, 
Okay, no, the, the, as you said, the, the SAIST initiative uh, is uh, based now on the idea of creating a center for tumor therapy. For tumor therapy, okay, sorry, I missed it. Okay. okay. Uh, Thank you. Questions over there? Uh, hello, good afternoon. Thank you very much for the presentation. My name is Nenad and I actually work for a civil society organization, Helvetas, which is present in the region. And I have a very concrete question. You, you said something is, uh, has changed in, in terms of how the political elites, how maybe scientists also see or what is the impact of, of, of scientists to, uh, to the political elites to convince them uh, in, in regard to SAIST and how the SAIST can function. Do you think that maybe kind of a bottom-up approach and mobilizing citizens to uh, support this idea could improve or move things forward inter intergovernmental organization or to have something similar as CERN, having in mind that science diplomacy or peace dialogue in this region would be very much needed? I don't know if technically it's possible to show, because I had a couple of reserve uh, slides, one was on science diplomacy, uh, because I have been involved in this uh, in the last part of my career. I originally uh, was on superconducting magnets, but in the last 10, 12 years, I was on uh, the relations of CERN with other international organizations, for instance, with the United Nations when we got the status of observer. And I must say that I'm, I'm quite pessimistic because uh, the, what is called science diplomacy, we can uh, have a debate on that, uh, is in reality something that countries would like to develop uh, to, uh, let's say, obtain advantages for their own diplomacy, which is not exactly what uh, uh, the solution of global problems should call for. Now, coming to the real capacity, capability of uh, um, scientists to influence politicians, I must say that we are really very weak. Really very weak because, uh, for instance, the bottom-up approach is interesting, but look at, yesterday we had an economist here. Economy, economists do not uh, try at all to convince the general population about the, the beauty of their economical theories. They go straight to those who decide, who are the politicians. And politicians speak a different language than our language. And we are not used to, 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 to interact with them as the uh, economists have, for instance, we are not used to have coffees with them uh, very often when uh, the big problems are to be discussed. And sometimes we are a little bit also intimidated by the role of politicians because they have the power and also the power to control the money that uh, is needed to do research. Uh, I have uh, a great estimation of people who are advisors to politicians. I know many of them. But very often, their advice is a, a very good advice based on objective facts, but is simply not taken into account. So what I think, and this is also, uh, to conclude, related to the influence of politics on, on, on science, on big science, what I think is that uh, the scientific community should have the courage to speak more loudly and more directly and, uh, and calling things with their name. Okay, so this is a takeaway message. Thank you very much, Maurizio. This was very interesting. Yeah. Great presentation. Thank you. We move now to, uh, uh, we go back to the uh, order of the, of the program uh, with uh, Karine Schemla. She is online. Uh, she is uh, from the Laboratoire Sphere, the CNRS, the Centre National de la Recherche Scientifique, Paris City uh, University. Uh, her presentation will be on the Forgetting the, resul the results of advanced knowledge, an historical perspective. So this is quite unusual. Uh, we are um, looking forward to listening to you, uh, Karine. Karine? Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Michel. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Very good. Excellent. Perfect. Thanks a lot. And thanks a lot to Mauricio Bonnard for having jumped in when I had the problem with sharing my screen and I had to relaunch the the application. <laughs> um, I want first to thank a lot the organizers and especially Nebosha for all the hard work that they have put in the preparation of this very important conference. I'm sincerely sorry not to be in person with you because such type of interdisciplinary exchanges are very meaningful for me. However, I problems have compelled me to stay in Paris. I, 
want to thank the organizer not only for having organized a meeting on a very important topic, but also for having included history of science as one of the fields with which to think about these issues. And I have to add that it's a kind of miracle that my talk comes after that of Mauricio Bonnard, because even though from a very different perspective, I address similar issues that became important in a post-World War II context. We can discuss about that at the end of my talk if you want. After some reflection on how to contribute to the theme of the conference, I have chosen to focus on an issue that, as history suggests, seems to me to need some attention, at least more attention than is usually given to it. Indeed, for basic sciences to possibly be a resource for a sustainable development, we need to achieve a sustainable development of the basic sciences themselves. However, and this is what I would like to emphasize in this talk, history shows that on several occasions in the past, basic sciences that had been developed in a given context not only stopped being developed in this context, but were even gradually forgotten. I'm convinced that episodes of this kind require some reflection for us to ensure a sustainable development of the basic sciences. And I'm going to outline an episode of this kind and discuss some of its consequences consequences that the state of affairs I'm going to present and take. Since I'm mainly a historian of mathematics in ancient China, I have chosen an example in Chinese history. However, we must keep in mind that episodes of this kind were quite frequent in history. At the end of this presentation, I will refer to other similar episodes. So let me begin by outlining something about the history of mathematics in China. At, in the second half of the 13th century, a whole series of mathematical works written in Chinese appeared. At the time, China is cut into two. In the south of China, where the Southern Song Dynasty has escaped, Qin Tio Shao writes mathematical writings in nine sections. In the north of China, which at the time when Mongol, Mongols have invaded the northern part of China, which is then cut from the southern part, Li Ye publishes two books, and I'm going to speak about the second of them, Deploying Pieces of Areas. I will not uh, use the whole title, it's not important here. Finally, at a time when China has been reunified under the Mongol rule, Zhu Shedie publishes two very important books. All these books, attest to the knowledge at the time in China of very sophisticated mathematical pieces of knowledge. Pieces of knowledge that were unknown, as far as we can tell, everywhere else in the world. Let me begin with North China and Li Ye's book, Deriving the Pieces, um, and I have highlighted in this page of this book by Li Ye things that are not Chinese characters, but are written using a decimal system that were used at the time 
in <coughs> China. Let me first uh, explain to you this system. I have highlighted in blue uh, one of these strange expressions that I have written with Arabic numerals. Here in green, I have highlighted the second one, and in red, the third one. So, uh, let us first concentrate on these expressions, which are numbers written using a place value decimal system. Uh, with this, I mean it's a system of the kind uh, that when we write uh, one, two, three, the one means 100 because of the position in which it is placed. Here we have a system of exactly the same type. So, for instance, here you have a four uh, written with digits inspired by the use of calculating rods. This corresponds to the fact that there was a surface on which computation were carried out. So this is a digit for the units. Here you have eight, five plus three, digit for the unit, to its left, two with rods used horizontally, still to its left, two uh, for 200, and we have here 228, as I wrote here. You see that there are zero as digits and zero as numbers. Finally, you see that the numbers that are crossed out with an oblique stroke refer to negative numbers. So what we have here, uh, if we step backwards, is not only numbers, but polynomials and equations written with a place value notation. In the same way as one, two, three written horizontally meant 123, one, two, three written vertically can mean uh, one plus twice x plus three x to the power two, as we have here an example. Uh, it's a constant term plus 228x. And it, we know it's a polynomial because of the character that occurs here. However, here, when we have no character, this is an equation. So, in this book, we have equations, equations of any degree, in fact, with positive and negative coefficients. We have mathematical symbolisms to write sophisticated mathematical objects. The book further assumes that, at the time, people knew how to look for roots of algebraic equations of this kind, and in fact, of any degree. We do not find knowledge of this kind explained in Li's books, but if we turn to the south of China and Xin Zhou writing on mathematics, written one year before Li Ye published his first book, we have here an equation of the fourth degree, also written using a place value notation, so the constant term the term in x, the term in x squared, the term in x to the power 3, and so on. A constant term, here a fourth degree equation, and we have the beginning here of an algorithm able to determine a root of that equation and of an equation of any degree with coefficients positive and negative. Uh, in contrast with what we find in the south, uh, in, uh, in the north, I'm sorry, in the south, we do not have uh, polynomials, but we have equations, and we, we find knowledge of how to compute uh, a root for an equation of this kind. Uh, an algorithm that is quite general, because we will find this algorithm also applied to solve what you have here, <coughs> which is a ninth degree equation with coefficient positive and 
negative, I'm not going to enter into the working of the algorithm, but it's an algorithm that is associated in contemporary mathematics with the names of Ruffini and Horner, 18th and 19th century publications. At the time, as far as we can tell with the documents we know, this kind of knowledge was available nowhere else in the world. Also attested in southern China, also in Tim Chao's book, knowledge that we today associate with the name of the Chinese remainder theorem, namely, in particular, an algorithm to solve equations, congruences of this kind, uh, with certain conditions and even beyond these conditions. Again, as far as we can tell, this kind of knowledge was available nowhere in the world. Finally, at the time when China is reunified, I mentioned the name of Zhu Shedier. This is the last um, book of this series of books that we know published at the beginning of the 14th century. With Zhu Shedier, <clears throat> we have again a place value notation with polynomials and equations with four unknowns and using a uh, uh, planar symbolism, if you want. So we have to the um, below the character here, we have twice x minus x to the power 2. To the left, we have y. To the right of this character, we have z. And we have uh, mixed terms. So a whole symbolism was developed as well as establishing equations with polynomials of this kind and eliminating between equations. Again, a kind of knowledge that to our knowledge existed nowhere else in the world. But, and this is the point I want to emphasize, in the 16th century in China, knowledge about all types of polynom polynomials was lost. Not only were, was, for instance, the book by Zhu Shedier that I have mentioned, not only was it lost, but uh, knowledge, uh, but Lie's book, in which we also had uh, knowledge about polynomials, still existed, but people could not understand them anymore. So they republished the book, deleting all the parts that dealt with polynomials because they could not understand what this was doing. Moreover, the knowledge about solving higher degree equations was lost, and all the knowledge about what mathematical symbolism were writing, this was lost. Finally, the knowledge about the Chinese remainder theorem also got lost. And this is the question I want to ask. Why and how? This is naturally a key question to ponder if we want to think about the sustainability of the basic sciences. And this is all the more so that phenomena of the same kind are evidenced in many, many different places of the planet. We see a very important activity in the astral sciences in Babylon before the end of the common era in Uruk, which gets completely lost in these languages. Uh, we see important uh, astronomical, mathematical activity in Greek which gets lost in Greece uh, or not understood anymore uh, after the 6th century. Uh, in the Arabic world, we uh, see, starting in the 14th century, a uh, phenomenon of this kind. Hence, history tells us that this is a common phenomenon, phenomenon in the life of the sciences. 
and one that needs to be attended to. So in the uh, minutes that remain, I would like just to outline consequences in China of this kind of event. Consequences of having lost knowledge that existed in China in uh, the, 40th, the second half of the 14th, 13th century and the beginning of the 14th century. In 1592, European missionaries arrive at the southern door of China. At the time, there are still mathematical books published in Chinese. However, the knowledge they present is not as sophisticated as the knowledge that was available um, in the 13th century. Jesuit missionaries will devise the strategy of using scientific knowledge available in Europe to impress Chinese scholars and enter key imperial institutions at the service of evangelization. So we five see minutes. one, one minute? Five, five. Uh, okay, okay. I will be done before. Thank five you very much. Um, so we see here one key consequence of the fact that knowledge was forgotten. Second, it took, in the 18th century, it took knowledge of mathematics imported from Europe to be, for Chinese scholars to be in a position to understand again books that had become ununderstandable, like Lié's uh, deploying the pieces and, and so on. Meiji Chang learns from the Kangxi Emperor, a Manchu Emperor who finds it important to learn all possible sciences. He teaches even to bright um, young scholars, mathematics, and Meiji Chang learns from the Kangxi Emperor a form of algebra that Jesuit missionaries translated from European books. And several decades later, he publishes a book to report a discovery that the mathematical books of the 13th century I have mentioned could be understood again using this knowledge imported from Europe. Somehow this is what I have done with, when I have explained to you uh, the ancient Chinese mathematical symbolism, I have used types of formalism that were elaborated since the, uh, the end of the 16th century in Europe to explain to you the Chinese symbolism from the 13th century. And so it was only then that Chinese scholars understood that this knowledge that had been imported as European existed in China formally. And that led to work on the past of mathematics in China that restored a whole corpus of books that had almost disappeared and was about, in fact, to fall into oblivion. So the question I would like to end with are, how is scientific knowledge lost? What can we do to prevent scientific knowledge from being lost? I think this is an important question to which I suggest that we devote some attention. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Karine. You are perfectly in time. No problem. I hope that your message and your question will not be forgotten and that we have a chance to ask you a few questions at the end. Uh, but we have to move now to uh, uh, the next speaker, Alexander Karpov, from the Joint Institute for Nuclear Research, uh, GINR, in Dumna, in Russia, on the uh, island of stability in the periodic table of chemical elements. Okay, good morning. Oh, not to 
it's not already morning. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, I would like to start my presentation from the gratitude to the organizers uh, for inviting me, in particular Niboisha. Uh, I'm representing here Joint Institute for Nuclear Research, uh, and uh, I wrote the motto of the institute, uh, which is quite important, especially today, science bringing nations together. Uh, last time when I was uh, in this audience, it was uh, international year of the periodic table and I had a privilege and uh, pleasure to present here the story uh, for discovery of uh, uh, chemical elements, especially heaviest of them. And uh, in those time I started from this uh, picture of uh, original Mendeleev uh, periodic table uh, and discovery of um, periodic law made uh, 153 now years ago uh, based on 63 elements known to in, in this day and uh, this discovery was so important for development of uh, society that uh, 2019 was uh, proclaimed by United Nations and UNESCO as International Year of Chemical Elements. And now that is uh, again a uh, very important occasion uh, to talk here because of the International Year of Basic Sciences. Uh, well, you know that uh, periodic table is now almost two times larger than it was in the, in the, in the period in the time of Mendeleev. Now it consists of 118 chemical elements and uh, it is usually said that uh, only 90 of them uh, are naturally abundant with the heaviest element which is uranium element 92. Uh, in, even if it's not exactly true, uh, but okay, we, we may, may accept that and say, and, uh, say that um, among 118 elements, only 19 are naturally abundant. That means that uh, the rest of them are uh, synthesized artificially. Uh, of course, it is important to know uh, where from uh, this naturally abundant elements came from, why we have only 90 of them and then not more and uh, where and when uh, they were produced. This is a very well known picture of abundance of uh, chemical elements in the solar system. Uh, and uh, I think we know that um, our universe uh, uh, consists almost on 100% on from helium and hydrogen, even if it contradicts to the, our everyday uh, experience. And uh, those elements appeared uh, quite shortly after the Big Bang. Uh, so um, atoms were formed approximately 400,000 years after the Big Bang when the universe became cold enough uh, to, 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 to have not ionized uh, nature, but, uh, but nucleus and electronic clouds uh, as it should be for any atom. So a uh, periodic table uh, in the early universe look like this, helium and hydrogen, and that's all. And it is a quite interesting fact that at present uh, still uh, almost 100% uh, um, our world consists of helium and hydrogen. Uh, well, we also know that uh, heavy elements uh, uh, up to iron may be produced during, during stellar nuclear synthesis, so called uh, fusion reactions or star burning. Um, small stars may produce uh, only light elements, for her, like for example our sun may go only up to carbon, but uh, heavier stars may proceed further and uh, 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 synthesize elements uh, up to element 26, which is iron. So after uh, in the end of uh, evolution of even biggest stars, we have periodic table consisting of two, already 26 chemical elements. And then we, uh, we have a question uh, which was uh, put 
in many lists uh, for um, uh, most important questions for physics for 21st century, where from or how elements uh, from iron to uranium uh, were produced naturally. Uh, it, is, uh, it is known that uh, all of them uh, were produced basically in reactions in, uh, with neutrons. Uh, various kinds uh, of reactions in uh, different conditions in during the stationary evolution of stars, during very, uh, various catastrophic events in the universe like uh, supernova explosions or merging of neutron stars and so on. Uh, and uh, we, uh, at the moment, we not exactly uh, know all details, but in principle we uh, have more or less uh, complete a picture of um, nuclear synthesis in the universe and now that is very important period in science when we uh, may check our, our understanding, our theory and that is because of very uh, fast, um, very fast development of so-called multi-message uh, astronomy. Uh, first of all, uh, this growth of this uh, field of sciences is, is because of uh, discovery of, of the gravitational waves. Um, of course, uh, there was a question uh, uh, when we have uh, known all chemical elements uh, naturally abundant, we have a quite uh, obvious question, are there still heavier elements? And of course, we know the answer is yes, they are. Uh, I also should say that um, uh, heaviest Naturally abundant element was discovered uh, only in 1940s, it was astatine, and in the same year, uh, first artificial element was uh, synthesized and uh, became known, that was element 93 Neptunium. And this year is also important because in this year was uh, discovered the process which uh, now is believed it, um, uh, finally terminate uh, expansion of the periodic table and determine the limit of the, of the, of the, of the vault of elements. Uh, this process is spontaneous fission, the process when nucleus may disintegrate into two more or less equal parts. And um, you see how uh, uh, half-lives of uh, actinides starting from thorium uh, decrease while we go into heavier and heavier elements. Uh, what we see here is that is in logarithmic scale. Uh, oh, yes, uh, half lives and we, we see that um, uh, for thorium and uranium and many plutonium, uh, um, half lives are still bigger than age of universe. But then we go down and finally reach the limit of existence of uh, atoms as a system of nucleus and electronic clouds. And early predictions uh, say that this should happen around element 104 or so. And in, in those time, uh, it was uh, uh, the, the only theory of nuclear fission, uh, which was called liquid drop model, when nucleus uh, and fission of the nucleus was modeled by the charged liquid drop. And uh, its fission uh, was very similar to this uh, very nice uh, picture made in space um, by NASA. Yes, and the fission of liquid of just ordinary water in the microgravity conditions. Uh, just to remind that uh, this theory of nuclear fission uh, was uh, uh, made by uh, Bohr and Wheeler in 1939. And the process of spontaneous fusion was uh, discovered by Florov and Peterjak a year after. And according to this uh, theory, uh, spontaneous fusion was uh, explained um, in quite a simple way that that is a barrier uh, which prevents the compact nuclear system uh, from the disintegration. And for uranium, this barrier is uh, 6 MeV height. And uh, this barrier. Um, uh, prevent uh, uranium from fission on average for 10 to the 16 years. And then when we go to the heavy and heavy elements, barrier decreasing and decreasing, and when it disappears uh, completely, so we have a limit of existence of chemical elements. So picture is very simple. And this limit, ac limit according to the liquid drop model should, uh, should be uh, reached uh, around element 104. 
but of course we know that nucleus is not simply uh, a, a liquid drop, even charged liquid drop. It is a quantum system with uh, all these um, uh, peculiarities of uh, quantum system like structure, shell effects and so on. And instead of this picture, when we should have a limit uh, of existence of elements around here, as I said, around element 104. So basically, actinides should be uh, heaviest uh, elements in the periodic table. Instead of that, uh, we will see not monotonic decrease of the spontaneous fission half-lives, but at certain moment, uh, half-lives still start to increase, and we may have some hills on this picture, and these hills um, uh, will prolong the vault of chemical elements to heavier and heavier uh, examples. Uh, so the picture, actual picture, which was uh, basically predicted in 1966, first in Dubna and the same year in Frankfurt, uh, that uh, after the uh, continent, uh, which uh, continent of stable elements, which end up with uh, lead 208, uh, and after the peninsula where we have still more or less stable uh, elements like thorium and uranium, uh, we, we will have uh, some islands, bigger or smaller, and uh, one of the biggest islands was predicted in the vicinity of element 114, uh, with huge number of neutrons 184, and this island was called the island of stability of uh, chemical elements. Uh, as I said, prediction was made uh, basically in 1966, and since then there were many attempts to produce those elements uh, located in the vicinity of the island of stability on, on of course, uh, the purpose uh, to reach uh, its center is, um, was also there. Uh, and. Uh, it was not successful uh, for many decades. Actually, a uh, history of discovery of transuranium elements is shown here. So it, uh, it, it started as a saint in 1940, and um, uh, it was always connected with uh, certain inventions, appearing of certain technologies, uh, uh, reactors, accelerators, uh, some certain kind of separators, or um, uh, last period of, uh, of uh, synthesis of already super heavy elements was uh, very much dependent on discovery of new type of ion sources, uh, which is called the electron cyclotron resonance ion sources. Well, uh, that is the same picture, but in a more uh, artistic way, uh, showing uh, different ways uh, uh, of uh, synthesis of uh, unknown artificial elements as with neutrons, with light ions, with heavy ions, but um, uh, lead target, which is called cold fusion. And finally, the ship with uh, calcium 48, which is uh, reaching the island of stability. Uh, uh, and th this story was uh, quite successful. I also should say that uh, the story of uh, synthesis of super heavy elements became successful and possible only when we um, uh, unified our efforts. I mean that this happens in actually 90s, uh, when uh, at the Joint Institute uh, group led by Professor Organisian uh, succeed to unify a scientist and, uh, and, and industry uh, from Russia and United States, and that uh, gives the possibility to make experiments successful. So uh, experiment, uh, after many decades of unsuccessful attempts to synthesize just uh, elements located on the island of stability or proof and disproof this prediction, it, was, it became obvious that the only way to uh, produce a super heavy element consist in, uh, in, uh, in uh, um, reactions where we have quite light projectile, and this should be uh, the best candidate was calcium-48, very exotic uh, uh, isotope of calcium, and very exotic uh, targets like plutonium-244. And uh, experiment uh, 
may look quite uh, simple. So you have calcium, you, you have plutonium, you collide them and you have fusion of, uh, uh, of those uh, nuclei and you produce element what you want. You may change the target to lighter or heavier and in this way you can produce uh, element heavier or lighter than, than element 114 which is now fluorium. But actually as I said it was very very scientifically and technically complicated task. And, on, and only unification of efforts uh, made this uh, that possible. Uh, first, we should have a target which is uh, artificial material and um, uh, two reactors, uh, one in Russia and the second in the United States, were the sources of uh, target material. Approximately 50 to 50 percent of material uh, came from these two uh, laboratories. And uh, these two laboratories are the only in the world which may produce uh, this, uh, this type of, uh, of material. Uh, for example, this p picture shows uh, 22 milligrams of berkelium. That was annual production of uh, Oak Ridge uh, National Laboratory, the small green drop. That is the amount produced during one year of uh, work of the reactor. And then it was, this material was delivered to Dubna uh, and uh, in, uh, it was made a target uh, when this two, 22 milligrams was placed on the thin foil. And then it was irradiated with calcium 48, which is also not simple material. It's naturally abundant, but that is only one factory which uh, separates calcium 48 from naturally abundant calcium. And that is, uh, this, uh, that is in Russia, in North Ural region. And uh, annual production is quite small, only 10, 12 grams. And there was a challenging task to uh, fit and your production of this material to the, um, uh, to the consumption during the acceleration. And this became possible, as I said, only after uh, invention of uh, 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 ion sources, which are now called electron cyclotron resonance ion sources. And first example came from the France to Dubna in the middle of 90s. And only because of uh, that invention, uh, the story, the story was, uh, was successful. Of course, accelerator, which was specially, uh, specially uh, optimized uh, for synthesis of super heavy elements. And in those period, we succeed to reach a record intensity of calcium 48, which was 6, 10 to the 12 ions per second. And then uh, all these preparations during 10 years uh, finally uh, give us uh, 15 years of successful experiments uh, and during this uh, 15 years we uh, realized all these experiments with calcium 48 beam and succeed to discover uh, five new elements and in names of these elements you see the, 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 the reflect this big collaboration which I mentioned before. Uh, moreover, we uh, uh, succeed to reach the shore of island of stability and finally prove, uh, experimentally prove its existence, even if we not reach the center. And uh, as you may, might know that uh, last year, Professor Aganisian, who was the leader of uh, all this um, 20 years, uh, uh, 30 years uh, experiments, uh, got the UNESCO Russia Mendeleev Prize in the basic sciences and there was the first uh, uh, laureate, among the first laureates of this prestigious prize. So now, uh, periodic tables you see uh, consist of 118 elements. And now we think not only on discovery of those elements, but we uh, think about studying of uh, s uh, super heavy elements, Icelanders, uh, or the dot uh, nuclei, which appear as the decay products of super heavy elements. And uh, we also think uh, about expansion of known region of nuclei and uh, most important task, of course, is going up to yet heavier and heavier elements, elements of 119 and 120, which are, will be first elements of this eighth row of uh, periodic table. And for that, uh, we need increase of efficiency of experiments and not by factor two or three, but uh, factor 10 or maybe 100 uh, times. So we should uh, 
technically improve facility to uh, by tens of times to uh, study known elements, known nuclei, and to expand periodic table and chart of nuclei, as I mentioned, uh, to 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 uh, to, uh, to uh, all these three directions. And that was done. So uh, we uh, constructed a new facility, which is called uh, Super Heavy Element Factory. And the uh, facility was uh, consists of, uh, first of all, of accelerator, uh, which was a product uh, of, uh, I mean, what was uh, designed by our engineers, but what was constructed by basically uh, majority of member states of the Joint Institute for Nuclear Research. And uh, the result of this accelerator is that we again have a world record in intensity of beams and we succeed to increase intensity by a factor of 10. Then that is a new separators which have another factor of 3, just one minute, uh, in, 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 uh, in increase of the efficiency. And uh, facility was launched in the end of 2020 and we had first campaign in this facility. And I just uh, want to put uh, draw attention to the last two columns of the first experiment, which consists in synthesis of element 115. And you have two columns, total number of, uh, of Moscovium isotopes discovered, uh, um, produced in this very first experiment campaign. And what was done in all laboratories over all over the world during 10 years of, uh, of, of synthesis of these elements. And you see that this new facility is indeed superior to, the, to, to, to the, what we had before in the world. And that is a factor of three of, of number of uh, total number of uh, Moscovium isotopes uh, which uh, were known before. Uh, we think uh, further and next step, uh, which I should just briefly mention, uh, that is um, chemistry of uh, new elements which is very challenging task uh, and uh, of course uh, it is also uh, connected with uh, further uh, technical developments uh, uh, and for, uh, with that I would like to thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Alexander. So this is a quite a bold venture. I hope uh, it, uh, you will not uh, lo lose uh, the know-how of this collaboration with the, very, with the events occurring now, and that you can pursue the collaboration. So, um, thank you very much. Uh, it's really a, a, a nice uh, collaborative adventure. So, we move now to the last uh, presentation before we, have, we take some questions uh, by uh, Yuri Engelbrecht, uh, Estonian Academy of Sciences. World Academy of Art and, Sci and Sciences. So this is on modeling of complex uh, signals in nerves. Yuri. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm really pleased to, to, to attend the conference, which is really interesting, covering so many areas. And I would like to start with uh, two remarks. First. Uh, the topic of the conference is, as, as we all know, the basic sciences and sustainable development. And if you now think about the, the nerve pulse propagation, then probably this is the first question, how it is uh, related to the sustainable development. Actually, what I would like to tell you about is the importance of interdisciplinarity. This is an example where interdisciplinarity has really given our, 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 the, the new results. Uh, if you come to the sustainable development, all the goals, whatever the number is, 17, as in the official document, or more or less, depending on the, on the local and the conditions, then certainly there are so many problems that need interdisciplinarity to be taken into account. 
the, even the, the, the much spoken case of the, the climate changes and the, the think about physics behind it, chemistry behind it, marine science is behind it, and re, the, the food procession and, and disasters and all that. that then, so it, it really needs a lot of, a lot of, lot of uh, efforts from many different fields of uh, researchers. And the second remark is actually related to what, what uh, Neboisha uh, said uh, in, at the opening. It was a Monday night, uh, the opening session, that he uh, stressed that, well, you know that the, the communities are still somehow different. Uh, the physicists work on their own and, and the, the mathematicians work on their own and, and biologists and so on. It is, it's, come, it's the situation is actually a little bit better now because it's the people are understanding that we, we really need this interdisciplinarity and we need to work together. So what I'm going to speak, speak about is it's actually <coughs> about first the, what are the signals and then the background, which is a traditional background, and then the, the more uh, general background uh, taking into account many effects. And then after assumptions and hypotheses, I come to the mathematical model and, and the wave ensemble. So this is the, 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 the simply the outline. Now the very simple scheme of, the, of this modeling is shown here in this slide, and uh, this is actually, if we, if we very, make very simple description, then it's actually the axon uh, is, is uh, some kind of, of, of tube uh, with a special lipid uh, bilayer wall, which is called biomembrane, and, and it is filled with, with, with a certain liquid. And the typical signal, which is uh, also, also, also uh, show, shown here, this is, this is uh, the, the, what has been measured by very many experiments and, and has got a very special properties and then I'm not going to speak all about, about that, how the refraction length uh, and, and how the temperature involves and, uh, is involved and, and so on. And now the, the, the problem. There are very many models. First, Hodgkin, Huxley, Fitzhugh, Naguma for the action potential for the, for the same main, main signal. Then it is the, the mechanical uh, uh, displacements. And this is, these are measured experimentally by, by several researchers, Ivan Satasaki and so on in, in Europe. It's Heimburg from Copenhagen has done it. And there is a pressure change also within action that, that again experimental results and what is very important from the thermodynamical viewpoint there is also the, the temperature change uh, accompanying the, the propagation of the action potential and this is, this is really it's very small but nevertheless it's possible using the contemporary experimental technique it's possible to measure and if you put them all together then then you, you must understand how this system as, 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 a, as a complex system actually actually works well certainly we, we can pick up some kind of, of recommendations uh, from the past uh, one from Albert Einstein that makes things as simple as possible, but not simpler. This is well, well known, uh, this uh, saying. But what is actually important, it was uh, said by Alvin Toffler that this is the, the, what, uh, what is typical in contemporary the sort of uh, uh, building of science. One of the most highly developed skilled is this section. It means that we split up the problems into the smallest possible components and we are so good uh, at it, so good that we sometimes we often we forget to put the pieces uh, back together again. And the point is actually the really that if you have got these experiments, if you have got, the, got the, the, this, all, all this data, that, that what we are trying is, is just to put these pieces uh, uh, together. Well, the background usually is, is electrophysiology, 
And there are very many experimental results on the electrical processes in, in biological cells and tissues, and, and, and uh, they are very well developed. There are classical experiments. Hodgkin and Huxley actually did their experiments in the 50s of the last century. They, they earned the Nobel Prize for, for them. And so this is the, the quite, quite well-developed field. There are very good overviews that explain all the pathological situations, all the poss possible changes of these electrical signals. But now we come to the, the, the actually to the general background. What is this? It's first, it's biology. In biology, there is also under, it's understood. Uh, Dennis Noble, for example, from Oxford says that it's, there is a need for integrative studies. They themselves uh, are, are related to the modeling of the heart, uh, but this is exactly the same for, for the nerve pulse propagation. And now, what is very important is physics. Actually, the propagation of, of the signals is actually uh, it means that the, these are the wave phenomena. And it means that from the viewpoint of physics, you, you have to deal with the conservation of momentum. So it's a, or, or in, in, in some cases, we simply say the, the, the second law of Newton. And then we can't forget thermodynamics. So that, that this is actually the, 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 of all the physical processes, whatever they are, are actually the, the, they are governed by ther thermodynamics. And there is a temperature. It means that the Fourier law should be taken into account or at least understood what is the, the, the influence of, of the, the, the Fourier law in, in this temperature um, uh, generation. And suddenly, there are very many small, small details, again, from physics, like what is the influence of forcing of a, of a system, uh, the, the external forces, what are the internal variables, what are really the very, very such kind of the, the, the well-elaborated concept now in continuum physics or continuum mechanics, so that, that it's really, it's very much physics in it. Chemistry, certainly the ion transferred, excellent endothermic reactions, certainly the properties of, of the accents are, are uh, governed by, 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 by chemistry. And then we come to mathematics because we want to model the, the system. The, uh, speaking about mathematics, it means that you, you should uh, derive some kind of governing equations. And then certainly you, you are able to understand the key factors what is actually important is that, that sometimes it's, it's very difficult to explain it uh, to a biologist that modeling of changes means actually mathematically the usage of derivatives. Derivatives with respect to time or respect to the space coordinate and this means the change. So that the mo in the modeling if we deal with uh, some kind of mechanism we have to take it into account. And then certainly mathematics is a tool for checking hypotheses, and, and, and uh, as we now call it in silico modeling, not in vivo, not in vitro, but in silico uh, by computing, so that these calculations really give a lot of information how to really to, to, to uh, vary the, the parameters and so on. And last but not least, the philosophy comes uh, into the game. So that these are the universal ideas of modeling. Take, for example, this uh, Manuel de Landa, the, uh, this uh, intensive, um, uh, uh, intensive science. So that, again, these are the, 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 uh, the ideas that are really covered by, by general philosophical trends. And this is results in interdisciplinarity. So this is actually the, 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 all the, the general background. Now the scheme, again, out of scale, that giving the, 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 the profiles, the, the action potential by rate, pressure wave there in, 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 within the, the action, and the temperature change. 
and then there is a deformation of the biomembrane. So that we, again, we know from physics that if you, you have the transfer displacement, which is uh, e easy to, to actually to measure, then there should be also the longitudinal density change because they are related. And, and this is something that, that in, in modeling, it, it, uh, it's, it must be taken into account. Now, and then we start then, then from the hodgkin Huxley paradigm, so that electrical signals are the carriers of information. They trigger all the other processes. Uh, fiber, axoplasm in the fiber, it's uh, as a viscous fluid. Then biomembrane can deform under the mechanical impact and the ion channels, which actually govern the, 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 the um, a concentration of uh, ions uh, within uh, the, the axon and in the environment, these are uh, the, the, could be opened by, mostly by electrical effects, but also by mechanical effects. There are uh, some, some uh, experiments on it. And the temperature changes again could be could be caused by electrical or mechanical processes and then this viewpoint is, is flexible we can build up the, 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 the different models with what we have uh, have the hypothesis that the, the coupling forces uh, model the interactions the mechanical waves and and the heat production are generated uh, due to changes in electrical signals and this these changes also dictate the, the functional state, shape of the coupling forces. The, the formalism of internal variables is used for describing the exo- and endothermic processes, and there is also the feedback in, in, in the system. And now this is the block scheme, actually, that you get the, the input, some, some energy in, the, 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 whatever the signal is, action potential and ion current are um, the, uh, generated and it means that, that as a result the mechanical wave in biomembrane will be generated, the pressure wave in, uh, in axoplasm will be generated and, and all these electrical and, uh, and mechanical effects uh, also uh, influence uh, the temperature changes. So this is a very, very general uh, idea. And now, I'm sorry, I just present also a couple of equations because it's a mathematics is, is concerned. The indices, actually the capit, uh, capital T and capital X means the derivatives so that with respect to time and with respect to, 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 to coordinate, uh, the first uh, um, uh, 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 two equations are for action potential, the pressure wave is the next, the longitudinal displacement is a third, and then the temperature as a, as a modified Fourier, Fourier law comes uh, based on the modified Fourier law is the last one. And the, the forces are actually, these, these are related to the changes. And, and this, as I said, that, that, that depend on, on, on the derivative. So that actually the wave ensemble, what, which was shown before, this we, we have used the, the Spitzio-Naguma model, the simple one, could be also the watskin huxley model. Then there is an improved Heimberg-Jackson equation for the uh, longitudinal wave. There is a wave equation for, uh, uh, in the axoplasm, uh, which includes also the dissipation and also includes uh, the coupling force. And then the diffusion equation uh, uh, for, for the temperature, uh, which also involves, uh, if needed, internal variables. And transverse displacement, as we know from physics, is proportional to, to the, the gradient of the longitudinal displacement. So this is now, now the, the, the main wave ensemble, and there are some kind of in silico results, uh, so that, 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 that actually this part are, are all in, on the left, are the, the, the profiles. They are all scaled uh, against the maximum amplitude, so that, that uh, just to put them on, the, uh, on one uh, figure. 
And these are compared also to the ex experiments which uh, are uh, uh, pretty much the similar. Temperature is, is a little bit different because there are several mechanisms proposed and the several experiments show that, 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 that there might be some kind of relaxation and there might be some kind of, of longer, uh, uh, longer, oh, sorry. Long, long, longer uh, this uh, sort of time uh, for the, for the relaxation, but it also shows uh, the flexibility of, of the modeling. So this is actually the, 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 these uh, main, main results, and uh, the, now I come to the conclusions uh, just before the lunch. So that uh, the, for for modeling uh, signals in nerves, interdisciplinarity is needed. And what is the message which is important that physics shapes the signals in nerves? So, and sometimes it is said, that this, uh, this citation is also shown here from the, the book of the Pennyquick that the Newton rules biology. Whether we like it or not, so it, it, it may, we, we might, uh, might argue, but nevertheless, this, this is something that we wanted, wanted actually to demonstrate. So, and, and if somebody is interested in more in, in these, uh, the, these results, then last year we published the, the book by Springer. It's a modeling of complex signals in nerves and also uh, the, the, the about uh, the importance of physics. It's uh, in, in the European Physical Journal in, uh, recent, recently published. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much for your, your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Alexander, thank you very much for uh, this appeal for interdisciplinarity. This is very, very important. Uh, so uh, we have time for a few questions, so either for Karin Shemla, she is online, or for uh, Yuri Engelbert, or for Alexander Karpov. So uh, Luc Berger, yes. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Engelbrecht, for this very nice talk. And for underlining, I mean, the, the need of interdisciplinarity. I can only totally agree on this point. I have one question for you. Uh, you mentioned your model, your propagation model. It's uh, purely one-dimensional in space, as far as I saw. Uh, how would you extend your model to three, dim three spatial dimensions? Uh, are you going to uh, extend your gradients to two other spatial dimensions or will you use statistical methods like using neural networks or something yeah. like this? Yeah, uh, as you underst understood that this is a theoretical work and we really work, uh, trying to work together with, with uh, people uh, who do experiments in Dortmund, for example, or, or in Ox Oxford. Uh, and, and uh, this is, well, you know, experiments are really, they need quite a, quite a good accuracy. If we deal with, with this uh, sort of measurements, for example, the measurements of the, this transverse displacement, they are one or two nanos only. And, and if you deal with temperature, then it's, it's, it's also the, the milli degrees. So, so it's really very small change. But using the optoelectronical devices and all that, it's possible to measure them. So that uh, this is something that we, we try, try to really to work together, uh, but we ourselves, we are theoreticians and more, more coming to, from applied mathematics, as I said. Thank you. What's your questions? Yeah. Thank you very much for your uh, talk to all the speakers. Um, and I have a question also for Yuri. Closer. Can you hear me? Closer. Closer to the mouse. Closer, I Closer to the mouse. Practically inside my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, uh, so uh, you talked about uh, computation. It's related to the question: um, What is the uh, complexity? How many neurons uh, you model? One single neuron, or you model co uh, collections of neurons? And mm -hmm. what methods and what is the computational complexity? How oh, large I are these crash. computations? No, it's yeah. louder. We cannot hear. We cannot hear. So, uh, another question. Should work. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, but we cannot, we cannot work. Uh, another question. 
So yes, yeah. I, shall, I shall come later. Yeah. Uh, in your uh, teaching, you mentioned uh, that uh, the China Chinese had uh, higher equa the equations uh, of higher degree, and have you found uh, in your exploring uh, that uh, Chinese made something about uh, the equation of fifth degree, because uh, we know in mathematics that it is impossible solvation of the equation of fifth degree. So uh, maybe in your exploring, have you uh, found anything about it? Because if you, <laughs> it changes. Uh, yeah, yeah, certainly it's, it's uh, yeah, quite, quite interesting. So what, Thank you. Thank you for this question, yeah. which uh, allows me to clarify you know, I wanted to insist on the general questions, but I'm happy that you give me an opportunity to make precise what I meant. So, the type of algorithm that you find in China to look for what is at the time thought as the single root of the equation is a numerical algorithm which determines the root digit by digit. Like, if you want, like a division computes a quotient digit by digit. It's not, an, it's not an approach by radical. What is impossible to do in general beyond the fifth degree is to get a solution by radicals to um, any equation. Have numerical proof that can be general. So, in China, we do not have any evidence that approach by radical was explored. And this is very interesting because it shows that in different contexts, equations meant different things, where different objects were approached differently, and our concept of equation, I claim, is a synthesis of approaches that were developed in different parts of the world. So it's not an approach by radical about which the theorem that you mentioned applies. Thank you. Thank you for, thank you for, thank you for the question. And thank you for the answer. Uh, a question over there. Well, it would be. Yes, yes, it works. It works. Hello? Yeah. Yes. Would be interesting to know how many other instances of lost knowledge we are dealing with. For example, the atomistic knowledge, which was lost from after the Greeks or in the Romans in the Middle Ages and retrieved in the 13th century, is another case through the rediscovery of the rerum natura okay. and uh, mm -hmm. uh, I think that so, uh, would be interesting to know how many instances okay. we can really go through. Also the Arab countries yeah. I, I, I think also could be a case. So in fact I would like to, okay, I, I had to be very brief so I have not mentioned all the cases I know. But for instance uh, in present day mathematics it often happens that colleagues go back to books from the 19th century in which they find solutions to the problem they look for. So forgetting is everywhere, including in our world and um, lots of things that were found in the 19th century have been forgotten and um, my colleagues find them by chance in 19th century publication. So that's one issue that I have not mentioned, which shows that this issue is general. The second point, I would say, I would uh, insist on the fact that, uh, let us take the example of atom. You can have the idea that uh, atoms are an important um, 
concept with which to describe matter. But first of all, what you understand behind this statement can be very different. And what Lucrece understood, Lucretius understood with atom is very different from what we understand by atom. So there are knowledges and knowledges, and it's important to um, understand the nature of the knowledge and whether we can speak of knowledge or of a hypothesis that retrospectively became the correct answer to a question we, we raise. Mm -hmm. But you are absolutely right that it's really a phenomenon that we need to take into account and we need to think how to keep this knowledge that was developed and became forgotten. Thank you very much, Karim. This is really fascinating. Uh, the last question. Yes. Uh, yes, for Professor Karpov. Uh, uh, could you speak briefly about uh, the plans for going beyond element 118? Uh, is the thinking to use different uh, targets other than uh, Californium or to use uh, heavier uh, he heavier ions uh, for bombarding the targets and and what do you think may be the next element that might be discovered to add that new road to the periodic table <laughs> thank you for the question uh, first of all targets heavier than californium are not available so they are this material which is heavier than californium produced but in so small quantities that it is impossible to make a target and uh, just make an experiment so we have to go to heavier projectiles to produce elements heavier than 118. Uh, for example, uh, now it is considered to use titanium or chromium. So titanium is element 22, chromium 24. And uh, corresponding target, uh, for example, curium or californium again. Or berkelium for element 119. Uh, so there are some technical issues, some technical problems to, uh, again, with the beams, again, with the targets. Uh, there are some scientific problems to, 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 to predict uh, best conditions uh, for such experiments um, and uh, cross-sections of probabilities for synthesis. But all our experience said that um, uh, uh, probability for synthesis of next elements should be approximately 30 times less than uh, what we had for element 118. Uh, now we have this factor of 30 with new facility. So um, we, we gain factor 30 in efficiency and now we can spend it uh, to, in attempts to synthesize uh, new elements. Uh, I think we are basically ready uh, to start this campaign and um, probably next year it, it, it would be realistic that next year some experiments may start, I mean in Dubna. As far as I know, in uh, Riken in Japan, uh, they already uh, make some experiments for, um, maybe not regularly, uh, that is quite hidden, but uh, for maybe three years already. That, that is the situation, this <laughs> next elements. Okay. Thank you. So I think that we have to close now the session. I want to, I want to thank the speakers, Alexander, uh, Yuri, uh, Karin, and Mauricio. Thank you. Thanks for your thank you very much. And thank you to the audience for your everybody. attention. Thank you. Thanks to everybody. Bye-bye.